while we're getting started, um, I think I'll just go ahead and very briefly introduce myself. I know I know some of you because um, you've been on web my webinars before, uh, but my name's Kara Stiles and I'm the owner and head coach of a company called Bootcamp for Bedics. Um, I have type one diabetes and I've had that for over 30 years. I also have uh, insulin resistance, which essentially makes me type two diabetic and type one diabetic, also known as double diabetic <laughs> at the same time. So I know a, a lot about type one and I know a lot about type two because uh, I've had to learn a lot over the last couple of years. Um, I also have uh, sleep apnea. I use an insulin pump and I am learning how to use technology to sort of hack the software and the insulin pump to get uh, my blood sugar to where it needs to be. Um, most importantly, I am not a medical professional. Uh, so this is good for you guys because I can share with you information that um, medical professionals would probably be bound not or uh, not be allowed necessarily to share with you. Um, but you also need to remember to take whatever I say uh, with a grain of salt. If you don't agree with something that I say, don't do it. Um, if I recommend something, uh, you don't have to take my advice because uh, I'm not your doctor. Um, I'm a person who has a lot of experience with diabetes. I've worked with a lot of people with diabetes through my coaching service as well as through diabetes camps, but I am not always right. So uh, for whatever that's worth, uh, I hope we can uh, move on and have a, a, have a productive session. I am gonna check every once in a while in the chat window just to see if there are any questions uh, that come in from time to time. So if you do have questions, please feel free to use the chat window and I'll take a look at that every once in a while. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so we're gonna talk introductions very briefly. We'll discuss glucose and your body. And I know that this webinar is about the things that make you high or the things that cause your blood sugar to go high. But in order to understand how some of those things work, and some of them are really weird, uh, we first have to kind of review for everybody how glucose works with your body and how it uh, kind of gets absorbed into your body and what your body does with it. We'll talk about the liver. We'll talk about insulin resistance. We'll get to the list of things that increase your blood sugar. And then at the very end, if you guys are still here, uh, we'll talk a little bit about an upcoming eight week online live glucose reset uh, program that I'm running. And then I'll also ask you to vote for the next webinar topic, which is gonna be, I think, uh, July 28th. So moving on from there. Oh, um, before I forget, if you aren't able to stay for the entire webinar today, I usually do a coupon that's good for about three hours or so, starting at the beginning of each webinar until maybe a couple hours after the webinar. And uh, it's usually a pretty decent code for some of the courses that I have available online for sale. This is a free webinar, so you don't have you're not obligated to buy anything at all. Um, but if you do want to use the code HIGH, H-I-G-H, haha, because that's the topic of today's webinar, at online.bootcampforbetics.org, you're certainly welcome to do that. Okay, enough with that. Let's talk about glucose and your body uh, before we start talking about all the stuff that makes you high. So. I think we all know about one of the things that makes our blood sugar high, right? We know that carbohydrates in some form, when they're consumed by our bodies, can make our blood sugar high. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to show sort of at the top left corner of this chart here, uh, just under the word glucose, we see a pile of carbohydrates, potatoes and pasta and rice and all that kind of stuff. So uh, the carbohydrates, of course, start out as food. And then the next step in terms of, you know, getting those carbohydrates into your body is to eat the food. Um, and if you just follow the arrows on this, uh, on this sort of um, uh, image, uh, you'll be able to kind of follow what I'm talking about. So once you eat the food, uh, and that's 
the gal in the middle there, uh, your body actually breaks the food, uh, the carbohydrates down into uh, glucose. And glucose is a simple form of sugar. And like I said, I know this part is review for most of you guys, but we just have to get through it to establish the foundation to talk about some of the more complicated stuff. So the little uh, glucose molecule on the right-hand side of the screen is glucose that kind of floats around in your blood. No, uh, the glucose in people who are not diabetic or what I like to call the pancreatypical folks, uh, the glucose actually moves into uh, the cells in your body through uh, the use or with the help of insulin, right? The insulin comes from your pancreas. And so in a perfect world, in a non-diabetic, I shouldn't call it perfect, in a non-diabetic world or in a non-diabetic body, you eat the carbs, it turns into glucose or sugar, and then the sugar needs to get into your cells to give you energy. And so what happens is the insulin comes in and says, hey, um, glucose, I'm just going to help you get into the cells so you have energy. And everything works just fine. Um, also in a non uh, or also in a pancreatypical body, what happens with some of that glucose is that once it gets into the cells, it gets used as energy. So this is why athletes need to uh, oftentimes have carbohydrates or Gatorade or whatever to give them some more energy. The energy from the glucose goes into the cells and then the athletes can run or jump or do whatever it is they like to do. Um, so if you do not use up all of the glucose in your cells as energy if you're and most of us don't right like we're we're not constantly running around at top speed some of that glucose gets stored or some of that energy gets stored as fat uh, so when glucose goes into your cells with the help of insulin first of all it gets used as energy and it may also be stored as fat so do carbs make you fat? Eh, well, kind of. <laughs> it depends on how many you eat and how much exercise you're getting, right? Um, what also happens though with the glucose that's in your blood is it gets stored in another place. The glucose gets stored actually in your liver. And your liver is uh, basically, well, it's kind of, I've said this before, your, your liver is sometimes an a-hole, uh, but your liver can also save your life. Your liver holds a whole bunch of glucose inside of it um, in a more complex form of glucose called glycogen. And whenever your body thinks it needs more energy, your liver helpfully converts that glycogen back into glucose and releases it into your blood. So your liver is constantly trying to give you energy to keep you alive, to keep you going. And so your liver is constantly releasing glucose into your blood. So it's not just carbs. It's, it's uh, glucose stored in your body that's getting released into your blood that is sometimes causing your blood sugar to go high. Now I'm gonna stop real quick and uh, see if I can find my mouse and see if there are any questions so far. So give me, oops, give me just a second. There we go in the chat. All right, cool. I lost my computer mouse. This is so weird. All right, that's fine. So um, like I said, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and ask them via the chat. I'll stop every once in a while and, um, and uh, take a look at those. And if you, you can ignore that announcement that uh, you hear every five minutes, that's my new uh, spike app announcing my glucose out loud in a British accent. Uh, I chose British because it turns out not a lot of Americans can understand a British accent. So I feel like my privacy is safe uh, having my having my blood sugar announced in UK English instead of US English. Um, all that aside, uh, we talked about your liver. So uh, as I said before, your liver stores glucose for you, releases it into your bloodstream. Uh, sometimes your liver does this when you you may you may not actually need glucose. <laughs> so I know, I don't know about you guys, but I wake up in the morning um, and if I haven't taken the right amount of insulin the night before, my blood sugar is high. And you know how the doctors are always like, well, you need to have a morning fasting blood sugar of like 
70 to 90 or something like that, then you wake up and your blood sugar is 140 or 200 or whatever. Well, that may have something to do with your liver helpfully giving you some extra glucose overnight to help you wake up and give you energy in the morning. All right, so um, there's also additional insulin resistance that can be caused by several factors that can cause the um, sugar in your blood to go high. And so we'll talk about some of those over the course of this next hour or so. And so you're probably waiting very patiently for the uh, final exhaustive list of all of the things that can make your blood sugar go high. And like I said, uh, you might have some experience with some of these, but you may not uh, have known about all of them. So I'm hoping today that everyone at least learns one new thing. Okay, it sounds like we have a couple of voices who are not on mute anymore. So I'm gonna troubleshoot that briefly and see if I can. I'll uh, get out of here real quick. Just a moment. There we go. All right, and uh, like I said before, if anyone has a question, you should please feel free to use the uh, chat function inside of Zoom. So I'm gonna just go ahead and scooch that over to the side there. All right, so as I said before, we already know about this, right? Carbohydrates, eating them can cause our blood sugar to go high. Here's something else that can cause our blood sugar to go high. Uh, adrenaline, which is also known as epinephrine and cortisol. These are two hormones that are released by your adrenal gland behind your kidneys. And um, there are a lot of circumstances, and we'll talk about some of those um, as well today, that can cause the release of adrenaline and cortisol in your body. So, so here's what happens when adrenaline and, and or cortisol are released in your body. First of all, in many cases, you feel it, right? Like if you are having an adrenaline surge, something is happening and you feel it, right? Your heart starts to beat kind of fast and you start to get a little shaky and maybe you sweat or something like that. That is the adrenaline being released in your body. Uh, it's in some cases sort of like a fight or flight response that you experience. Fear can cause it, stress can cause it. When adrenaline, which is also known as epinephrine, is released into your body, your liver automatically, well, there's, there's actually a part in between there, so I should tell you about that. So when adrenaline or epinephrine is released in your body, that causes your pancreas to release glucagon, and glucagon is what causes your liver to convert glycogen into glucose. Now, you don't have to memorize all that. What you can remember, though, is that when you have an adrenaline surge, when your heart's beating really fast and you're sweating, then there is a good chance that your liver is gonna try and help you out by giving you extra energy and squirting glucose into your blood. And if you don't have the ability to get insulin into your blood right away, whether it's through your you know, barely functioning pancreas or whether it's through an insulin injection, then your blood sugar is gonna go high. Looks like we have a question from someone about um, accessing this webinar later. And yes, I will uh, post this webinar and send it to everybody who registered. Uh, so you will be able to watch this later if you want to. Um, cortisol is, um, I'm just gonna shut this off because that's being really annoying. Uh, so cortisol is another hormone that is essentially designed to reduce inflammation inside of your body. So your body actually releases cortisol when you get sick uh, because you're not just, you know, you're not just sick because you're swollen visibly in a specific place, or you're not just inflamed because you're swollen visibly in a specific place. Uh, you are inflamed or you have inflammation basically at the cellular level. And so when you're sick, your body releases cortisol to try and reduce that inflammation. And cortisol, much like adrenaline, causes your uh, pancreas to release glucagon, which causes your liver to convert glycogen into glucose. So basically a cortisol surge can give you a spike in blood sugar. So what 
causes some of these adrenaline surges and cortisol surges? Uh, some of these answers are obvious and some of them may not be. But did you guys know that um, caffeine is yet another thing that can potentially cause your blood sugar to go high? It reminds me I should take a sip of my coffee. Mm -hmm. So caffeine, um, we use caffeine uh, to, to basically like stay awake and give us energy, right? Caffeine doesn't have any sugar in it, but somehow it supports us staying awake. And that is because caffeine is a substance that causes your body to release a little bit of adrenaline. So if your body releases a good amount of adrenaline as a result of drinking a cup of coffee, then that cup of coffee could raise your blood sugar. And I know a lot of folks, uh, specifically type ones as well as type twos who are on short acting insulin, who actually have to take a unit or a half a unit of insulin via injection or via insulin pump just for a single cup of coffee. I also know people who are totally unaffected by caffeine at all, and they've been diabetic for years. And so while caffeine could affect your blood sugar, it doesn't necessarily have to affect your blood sugar because everyone's different. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions in the queue, so I'm going to move on to the next uh, adrenaline releasing cause, which is stress. So you've probably heard your doctor say something like, oh, just reduce all the stress in your life and you'll be more healthy and you won't uh, have such high blood sugar. And of course it's, you know, in essence, it's, it's, it's true, but like how easy is that to just reduce all of your stress? Um, there are actually some drugs that can help you uh, reduce your stress and a lot there's a stigma associated with these drugs. They're mostly um, antidepressants, SSRIs or SNRIs, or even in some cases um, for folks who have really high levels of stress, um, benzodiazepines can be really helpful as well, though those are um, somewhat habit forming and um, you can build, build up a tolerance to those. Uh, but if you do have a high, high level of stress in your life, and you believe that it is causing that adrenaline surge in your body and causing your blood sugar to go high, we've got to figure out how to get your blood sugar to come back down. And one of the ways to do that is through um, exercise. Another way to do that is through uh, antidepressant medications. And another way to do that is through meditation, uh, yoga, that sort of thing. It looks like there's a couple of questions coming in. Uh, one is, can cortisol be measured by a test? Uh, yeah, you, there are some tests that you can take, and I don't know what they're called, uh, but your doctor should be able to order them to see if you've got cortisol buildup um, in your blood or in your blood plasma. And in fact, um, it was just recently discovered, I read this on um, one of the NIH uh, uh, abstracts that even uh, like steroid medications um, that are taken through the nose, you know, like Flonase or um, Cordate or whatever it's called, um, that are supposed to like help reduce the inflammation in your nose, those can actually cause a buildup of cortisol in your body and can cause the high blood uh, sugar as a result of that. Uh, we have another question. Is there any way to mitigate the effects of the caffeine? My morning coffee spikes me. Um, that's a hard question to answer because I don't know if you are taking um, any uh, any insulin or any short-acting insulin. Um, if you do take short-acting insulin uh, and you know what it means to pre-bolus or to take insulin a little bit early, like before your coffee, that's certainly something you can do. Most people are able to get away with one half to one unit. Um, if you're only taking basal insulin at night, um, it's going to be really hard to mitigate the effects of the caffeine in the morning because you're not, it's, so, so mornings are hard <laughs> because you, you typically wake up um, in the morning being uh, really, really, really insensitive to insulin anyway. Uh, and so sometimes even taking, I mean, I could suggest a morning walk before your coffee, and that is just as likely to potentially raise your blood sugar as it is to lower it um, simply because of the way that your liver works. Uh, I have discovered that the first cup of coffee in the morning 
is the one that affects me the worst and subsequent cups of coffee really don't. What I would try to do is see if you can brew a half calf um, and see if that cup of half calf um, affects you as badly as the cup of full calf. And if it doesn't, um, drink two cups of half calf <laughs> and see if that helps. That's what I brew now instead of full calf because I just can't cope with the full calf. And even, even though I take insulin, um, I am just not able to control what the caffeine does to me. Um, as you can see here, hang on, I'll show you. This just makes me infuriated. My blood sugar's been like 167 for like the last hour and a half. Um, you can see it came up from, wait a minute. I got this up on screen. Sorry, I digress. I'm just so interested in all this new tech that I'm gonna share it with you guys. Um, but yeah, so essentially um, I started out, uh, the morning, uh, doing okay, kind of down here in this green section. And then, oh, wait a minute. No, that was yesterday. Or no, yeah, that is today. Um, so I was doing okay. And then I had some coffee shortly after six. So this is the 6 a.m. line. Um, and probably starting around seven or eight, I was up to 167. And I have not come back down. And what that probably means is that I just need to... I just need to um, take some more insulin. I'll do that later though, because I don't want to interrupt, um, interrupt what we're doing here. So, uh, but yeah, try, try half calf, see what happens. And really, you know what, next time, if half calf doesn't work, try quarter calf and then just drink four cups of it and see what happens. <laughs> okay, uh, crying is very much related to stress. And so, maybe crying shouldn't be its own slide because this is really coupled with that um, with that stress response that adrenaline response where you get upset and and all of a sudden your body you know releases that adrenaline and then your liver releases glucose into your blood and then your blood sugar goes high here's something that is so interesting and frustrating though at the same time about crying which is that for some people with diabetes crying actually lowers your blood sugar. Now here's why that might happen to you. Instead of having crying, raise your blood sugar. Uh, for, well, as, as you probably know, in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases, exercise, at least mild to moderate exercise, as long as you have some insulin on board functioning in your body, will lower your blood sugar. Well, guess what? crying requires a lot of energy for some of us. And so our body is kind of treating that like we're using a bunch of energy, like we're exercising a little bit. And so in that case, as long as you have insulin on board, and as long as you have at least some sugar or energy in your cells, your blood sugar could go down because crying could have this, a similar effect to exercise. Or it could have the adrenaline effect and raise your blood sugar. Or one day it could lower your blood sugar and then the next day it could raise your blood sugar and that's my problem with crying which is why those benzos come in really handy especially if you're upset because they keep you from crying and that makes your blood sugar nice and level i'm just kidding i don't use benzos all that often but they are really helpful ah uh, okay doesn't look like there are any additional questions uh good questions so far though you guys let's talk about high intensity exercise. Uh, so this isn't fair uh, because high intensity exercise, while it causes high blood sugar in some people sometimes, can also cause low blood sugar in some people sometimes. So first of all, high intensity exercise uh, re causes your body to release adrenaline, right? We know this because we can feel it. If we start running at top speed, your heart starts beating fast and you're sweating and you get shaky and all that kind of stuff. Well, Yes, your body is releasing adrenaline and that's causing your liver to say, oh my gosh, you need some sugar in your body and I'm going to give you some. And so that sugar shoots right into your body and that high intensity exercise has caused your blood sugar to go up. This is why doctors always say if your blood sugar is really high and you have ketones, do not do high intensity exercise. That will make things worse. And that's true. However, if you engage in high intensity exercise and you have actual functioning insulin on board, meaning you've either taken an injection of uh, short acting insulin within the last six hours, or 
you have type 2 diabetes and still have a partially functioning pancreas that administers insulin to you, um, in that case, the high intensity exercise can actually lower your blood sugar instead of raise it. So how's that for clear as mud, you guys? It's ridiculous and it's not very fair. All right. Um, oh, one last thing on high intensity exercise. If you do engage in high intensity exercise, uh, try to do it in a non-fasting state. It is less likely to raise your blood sugar if you are not fasting, meaning if you've eaten and your body has somehow consumed insulin within the last six hours, uh, you won't have such a bad blood sugar spike from that. Okay. So <laughs> who's had prednisone or a cortisone shot before? Uh, I'm sure at least someone on this webinar has. So uh, these steroid medications mimic the effects of the hormone cortisol. They are supposed to reduce the inflammation that's in your body. Uh, maybe you get these after surgery. Maybe you get a cortisone shot in your foot because something's terribly wrong with it and there's a horrible amount of pain going on. Maybe you have to take prednisone because you had a terrible lung infection and you need to reduce the inflammation in your lungs. Um, fine. These things are necessary uh, in some cases, and if a doctor prescribes them, you should probably take them. Uh, however, what doctors don't know is how to tell you what to do once you're taking the prednisone and your blood sugar shoots up to 300 or 400. Uh, so um, know that steroid medications will raise your blood sugar quite a bit. They will also uh, make you very insulin resistant. And so you wanna be really careful about only taking them if you actually need them. And if you are taking insulin, you might actually have to increase your insulin by in some cases up to an additional 50%, uh, depending on what type of insulin you're taking in order to get through that uh, full course of, of prednisone or cortisone or whatever. Um, even the cortisone shots, I know that that's like a one-time thing. You go to the doctor, you get the really painful shot, you scream, and then you come home and, and, and then you're done. That can actually stay with you for a couple of days and keep your blood sugar high for a couple of days. So just keep that in mind. If you're going to be on steroids. Um, uh, make sure you do something about, about the uh, result in increase in blood sugar. And by the way, this happens in pancreatypical people too. Uh, some people have to have steroids all the time, like they have some sort of chronic illness that requires them to take steroids all the time and you can actually have steroid induced type two uh, diabetes simply because the steroids cause everyone's blood sugar to go up. All right. Does anyone know what Dawn Phenomenon is? Go ahead and type in the chat if you've heard of Dawn Phenomenon. You can be like, yeah, I've heard of this. Or you can say, uh, no, what the heck is Dawn Phenomenon? Or you can say, yeah, that happens to me every single morning, uh, which is not really a phenomenon. Um, it, in fact, is something that happens to everybody, not just people with diabetes. So um, as you know, our, the, the pancreas in non-diabetic people just automatically regulates your blood sugar for you by producing insulin. Um, for those of us who have type 1 or type 2, either our pancreas doesn't work at all or it just doesn't work as well as it's supposed to. But guess what? Every morning or usually a couple of hours before the morning, a couple hours before you wake up, uh, your body starts to realize that it is going to get up kind of soon, right? Like, it, especially if you get up um, at the same time or close to the same time every day, your body kind of gets into this rhythm and your body knows, you know, at four o'clock in the morning that it's going to be waking up in three hours. Well, in pancreatypical people, non-diabetics, uh, what happens when the body starts to know that it's going to wake up um, is the um, liver, <laughs> our helpful liver, actually releases glucose into the blood and the pancreas releases insulin into the blood. And so with the glucose in the blood and the insulin in the blood, guess what? All that glucose just perfectly makes it into the cells in your body, giving you energy. 
And that's why uh, a lot of people who don't have diabetes can just like wake up and pop out of bed because everything's working perfectly inside their body and their uh, pancreas just gave them insulin and their liver just gave them sugar and their cells are just filled with energy and they can get up and be happy and not even need a cup of coffee in the morning. And then there's us, those of us with diabetes who are like, oh my gosh, I should feel like crap. My blood sugar is like 240. Why is my blood sugar 240? I went to bed last night and it was only 90. And that's because your liver was trying to help you. It, it was trying so hard to help you, to give you this energy so that you could wake up and your stupid pancreas was like, meh. So um, basically you've got sugar running around in your blood. Your liver wanted to give you energy. Your cells have no energy, which makes you feel like crap. Your blood sugar's high, which makes you feel like crap. And so as diabetics, we do not just bounce out of bed in the morning all happy and ready to go. There's some stuff that we have to do in order to, uh, in order to get that sugar that's in our blood into our cells. So it is not a phenomenon. I don't know why they call it that, but that's kind of what happens. Oh, I see, you guys answered. Yep, some of you have had some experience with Dawn phenomenon. It's obnoxious. Um, if you are only, I should say this, if you're only on um, long acting insulin or you're not on insulin at all. Um, if you're not yet up to the top dose of metformin, you can take the immediate release metformin at night and that will actually suppress your liver's release of um, glucose into your blood overnight. And that should help um, not just with the dawn phenomenon, but for the person who asked about the coffee, that might help a little bit with the coffee um, issue. So if you can get immediate release metformin, take that at night, then um, that might help a little bit. Okay. Next, we'll talk about uh, some alcoholic drinks. So alcoholic drinks can raise your blood sugar, and they do, if and only if those alcoholic drinks have carbohydrates in them. And you would be surprised, because mostly when we think of drinks with carbohydrates in them, we think of margaritas and strawberry daiquiris and some sweet wines and that sort of thing. But probably the best beers I've ever had, usually the really hoppy ones, can have up to maybe 20 or 25 grams of carbohydrates in them per 12 ounce serving. And they don't even taste sweet, they don't taste sugary, but they can have that many carbs in them. So alcoholic drinks that have carbs in them can cause your blood sugar to go up. However, over time, alcohol can cause your blood sugar to go down. And so we'll, we will talk about that probably during another webinar. Uh, and we're actually gonna vote at the end of this webinar on whether we're gonna um, have a webinar on drinking safely while diabetic or another topic, which I forgot, but I'll announce um, a little bit later. So alcoholic drinks, if they have carbs, can immediately raise your blood sugar. Over time, they can lower your blood sugar. But if you're looking to just keep Kind of an even blood sugar going and you still want to have a drink or two um, i would go with a dry red wine or one of those super light low carb beers or my favorite drink is actually a diet seven up with a little bit of bacardi limon and some crushed mint and some lime juice i got that recipe from my aunt rhonda that has basically 80 calories and zero grams of carbohydrates. And so that will not raise your blood sugar, but it could lower it over time. All right, doesn't look like there's any questions on alcohol. So how is this for fair? <laughs> it's actually true that uh, low blood sugar in a couple of different ways can cause a high blood sugar. So of course, one way a low blood sugar can cause a high blood sugar is if you overeat during that low blood sugar. And if you've had a low blood sugar, you know how it feels, right? You, you can't just drink four ounces of juice and then resume what you were doing and be perfectly fine, right? Especially if you have a low blood sugar in the middle of the night, you wanna go um, into the kitchen and like eat everything in the refrigerator and the cupboards, right? And so over treating a low blood sugar, of course, will um, ultimately result in a rebound or a high blood sugar. Here's another way a low blood sugar 
can actually result in a high blood sugar, even if you don't over treat your low blood sugar. Let's say you're being perfectly behaved and you go have your, you know, four to six ounces of juice or whatever because your blood sugar is low. Well, guess what? You know how sometimes when you, your blood sugar becomes low very quickly, or if you've been low for a while and you only just start to realize it, you start to sweat, you start to get really shaky, your heart starts to beat really fast. Guess what's happening? That's adrenaline, right? So a low blood sugar, if, if, it come, if your blood sugar comes from high to low too fast, or if you've just been low for a long enough time and your body doesn't realize it, your adrenal gland will push adrenaline into your body and that will cause your blood sugar to go high as well. So that's basically a double treatment, right? If your adrenaline's treating your low blood sugar and you're drinking six ounces of juice to treat your low blood sugar, that kind of explains why your blood sugar is 300 an hour after it was 40. So, sorry about uh, that news. Cool. All right. Uh, a glucagon injection can certainly cause high blood sugar. So essentially, um, for, for those of you who are on short acting insulin, you should actually have glucagon somewhere accessible to you and your loved ones, because this is an injection that can save your life if your blood sugar is too low. So a glucagon injection is either an intramuscular or subcutaneous injection um, that you can put into your body. And the glucagon injection forces your liver to release um, a whole bunch of glucose into your blood. So this is sometimes what paramedics use when uh, they're called because somebody's having a diabetic seizure due to low blood sugar, or if somebody's unresponsive due to low blood sugar. Um, but we can administer glucagon injections ourselves if we're conscious. And I have actually done this on myself a couple of times because I was sick and I was throwing up because I had the flu and I had just, I had just taken insulin because I was going to have some breakfast. So I had like four units of insulin in my body and I ate breakfast and of course it didn't stay down. And so there were like no carbs in my body. And so I had to force my liver to um, give me some sugar. And so I took a little mini dose of some of this glucagon stuff. And that's something that can actually save you from having to go to the hospital or having to have the paramedics come because of a, a diabetic low blood sugar emergency. So glucagon though makes you feel kind of yucky after you've had it. A lot of people get sick uh, simply because of the way that it functions. And so in addition to glucagon, a treatment for emergency low blood sugars is IV dextrose. So if you're in a low blood sugar diabetic emergency, um, typically paramedics will come and if they don't use glucagon or if glucagon's not part of their protocol, they might start an IV line on you and basically give you sugar water through your vein. And that's what IV dextrose is. It comes in uh, different concentrations. And here's something that's important to remember. Uh, for a lot of folks who are going into some type of surgery, um, usually usually the uh, nurses or the, the surgery prep team will start an IV on you and give you fluids um, just as part of the surgery. Well, sometimes those fluids are normal saline, which is basically salt water, which is fine. Sometimes they give you D5. And if you're diabetic and you're about to go into surgery and the uh, surgery prep team gives you, uh, starts a line with a bag of D5, they're basically pumping sugar into your blood. So you're going to wake up from surgery and your blood sugar is going to be, you know, really high. So it's important um, to ask. This is especially important for parents of children as well. If my kid's going into surgery <clears throat> or if I'm going into surgery, what are you actually putting in my veins? Is it going to be D5 or is it going to be normal saline? And you can actually say, hey, I'm diabetic. You know, can I have normal saline instead of D5? And then they'll roll their eyes because they have to change the order in the computer. And then they'll give you the normal saline that you asked for. All right. Um, again, feel free to ask questions. I know this is kind of a lot. Uh, I'm just going to and check the time and see how we're doing. Looks like we're doing just fine. So the next thing, here's a surprise for some of you that can cause high blood sugar is short needles. Now, the uh, companies that produce insulin needles and pen needles 
will swear up and down that there is no difference between using a long needle and a short needle and that the short needle works just as well as the long needle because they've done a bunch of tests. And they did all of these tests in perfect circumstances with perfect people who were being observed, who were using the needles exactly as they were supposed to be used each and every single time. And that's probably true that uh, when people are being supervised by, you know, the manufacturing company um, during a, like, you know, test, then they probably use the needles exactly as they're supposed to. However, for those of you who have used the little tiny short needles and you've injected insulin into your skin, you may have noticed a little like bubble uh, under the skin or a little bump under the skin. And that means that the insulin is not absorbing at the rate that it's supposed to absorb, which can cause a high blood sugar. So if you are like, gosh, my insulin just doesn't ever seem to work or gosh, I seem to be on way too much insulin. Um, you know, I wish I could like not have to take so much insulin. Think about getting a shorter needle. And I would say um, probably the shortest anyone should ever use is I think like five sixteenths of an inch. Um, that's the blue one in the middle there on that BD Ultrafine uh, uh, graphic there. Most of us have, or most diabetics now are getting the teeny tiny needles and um, I think for a lot of people, especially since a lot of us have a little bit of extra skin, um, it's not going to hurt us to go up a size in needle, especially if it's going to get that insulin into us a little bit more quickly. Okay, so um, excessive thyroid hormone uh, can cause insulin resistance and it can cause the liver to release an increased amount of glucose into the blood. Uh, and so if you do have hyperthyroidism, um, please make sure you're taking the medication that's been prescribed for that. And if you still feel like uh, you have increased insulin resistance due to your hyper, uh, excuse me, hyperthyroidism, um, you can also mitigate some of that insulin resistance with drugs like metformin, um, potentially Victoza, uh, any of the GLP-1s will help. Um, and if you're really, really um, in dire straits, you can try an SGLT2 inhibitor. I'm not a huge fan of those. Um, and we'll probably talk a little bit more that, about those in another upcoming webinar. But um, there, there are some things you can do to deal with some of that extra insulin resistance due to hyperthyroidism. Okay, so the pregnancy hormones cause insulin resistance. Any of us who have um, actually been pregnant while diabetic know that by the end of your pregnancy, you typically have to take about three times as much insulin as you took before uh, you were pregnant in order to keep your blood sugar under control. So if you're pregnant or planning to become pregnant, please remember that. Uh, here's another huge, huge uh, and very common reason for people not getting the right amount of insulin. It's not priming your insulin pen. Now, you're going to get a lot of mixed messages from doctors and manufacturers and friends and even from me uh, about whether and when you're supposed to prime your insulin pen. So in order to make absolutely sure that you are getting the right amount of insulin for every injection, you need to prime your insulin pen every single time. So before every injection, you need to prime your pen. No, priming basically just means sticking the needle on, dialing up to two units, and pushing out some insulin. And as long as you see some liquid come out, that means your um, pen is primed. Now, two units of insulin is expensive. That's what, like $4 worth of insulin or something like that? I mean, that's ridiculous. Why would you want to squirt out $4 worth of insulin every time? Well, um, a secret trick is to prime just with one unit first. As, as long as you see some liquid come out, that means your pen is primed. So you don't have to prime it with two units every time. But if you prime with one and nothing comes out, then you're gonna need to prime with yet another one. Okay, I hope that made sense. If that doesn't make sense, let me know and I can go get a pen and I can show you guys it real quick. If I can find an insulin pen. Um, okay, so <clears throat> this might be a surprise for some of you, or you might be like, ah, that explains some things. Higher altitudes have lower levels of oxygen. 
And so, so, and this doesn't happen to everybody, but sometimes in order to cope with the lower levels of oxygen in the air at the higher altitudes, your body releases cortisol, which helps to produce new red blood cells. And as you already know, uh, stimulates your liver to release glucose into your blood. Now that happens to some people, but much like crying, the opposite effects can happen to you at higher altitudes. So essentially your body could be working harder, in effect, kind of exercising harder, just being at this higher altitude, um, breathing a little bit harder because the air is so dense. Um, and, um, and so essentially your blood sugar could go low instead of going high at the higher altitudes. So um, just watch out for that. All right, let's see what's next. This one isn't always obvious, but um, uh, it happens for uh, those of us who are using insulin pumps, you can have a bad infusion set or a bad pump site, and that would certainly cause your blood sugar to go high. Um, of course, if you check your blood sugar um, and it's over 250 for, um, you know, four hours in a row and you don't know the reason for it, uh, check your pump site, you might have to replace it. Okay, we're getting towards the end, friends. Uh, who stockpiles insulin? Anyone? I guess you can't raise your hands, but go ahead and say, yes, I stockpile, or no, I do not stockpile my insulin. Why would I do that? Um, I totally stockpile my insulin because you never know when you're going to lose insurance. And as you know, insulin is really expensive. However, uh, it doesn't do any good to take insulin that's actually gone bad. So um, if you're stockpiling your insulin, please make sure that you're keeping it cold, but also make sure that you're not accidentally causing it to become frozen. So if it's way in the back of the fridge, that's typically where uh, stuff can sometimes freeze. And so kind of try to keep it in the middle of the fridge or um, I actually bought a separate fridge for my insulin stockpile and I turned it down to the lowest temperature, not the lowest, the, I turned it up to the lowest temperature. I don't know how to say this, but basically my fridge for insulin is a little warmer than a regular fridge. And so um, that prevents things from freezing. Typically lumpy insulin can be caused by uh, insulin mixing and using um, a syringe multiple times uh, with the same insulin bottle. Uh, so just keep in mind that if your insulin is bad or if your blood sugar is high and you you know, none of these other 30 reasons applies to you, then perhaps your insulin has gone bad and it's time to try a new bottle or a new pen. If anyone's using Fiosp, that's a new, very, very short acting insulin. Um, I found it to be pretty volatile at even just warm temperatures. So um, keep your stuff in the fridge uh, if you haven't opened it yet and keep it at room temperature or below if you have opened it. Okay. All right. This is called lipohypertrophy. This happens when you inject insulin essentially into the same area over and over and over and over again. This is why the docs are always telling us to rotate your injection sites, right? Use your arm, use your leg, use your stomach, uh, because every time you inject something into your body. It creates a tiny, tiny little bit of scar tissue. Well, if you keep trying to inject, inject, inject into scar tissue, more scar tissue gets created on top of the old scar tissue and all of a sudden you have injection lumps. And once there's scar tissue there, the insulin can't actually get through it to get into your body. So if you're injecting insulin into your scar tissue, you need to move your injection site. We actually had a little girl at um, diabetes camp a couple of years ago who uh, came to the infirmary and her blood sugar was 500 and she just had, you know, a whole bunch of insulin like two hours before. And we were like, why is your blood sugar so high? Did, are you sure you took your insulin? Where did you take your insulin? We looked at her arms and her poor little arms were just like filled with lumps because she wouldn't take her insulin anywhere else. So we had to work with her to get her to, you know, start using her stomach and her legs because the insulin will not work if, uh, if you're injecting into scar tissue. Also, uh, I know that 
Um, for those of us who are on a budget, we tend to try to conserve needles. And so we use the same needle more than once. And uh, really you're causing extra scar tissue if you use the same needle more than twice. So uh, my official non-medical advice is that twice is the limit. If you're going to reuse a needle, use it twice and then get rid of it and use another one. Okay. All right. So um, insufficient sleep actually increases the uh, cortisol amount that gets released by your adrenal gland, which of course, as we talked about before, causes insulin resistance and it causes your liver to release glucose into your blood. So let's make sure we're all getting the exact amount of beauty sleep we need every night. That's hilarious. I have two young children. That just doesn't ever happen, which is probably why my blood sugar is still, oh, up to 170 now. That's perfect. Okay. Next. Uh, so Generally, um, in the teen years for kids, um, there are these things called hormones that kind of come and go. And for both boys and girls, those hormones can make your blood sugars just go absolutely crazy. Um, sometimes you may need like three times as much insulin one day as you needed the day before. And so it's important to try and understand, especially with those kids, uh, the preteens, as well as the teenagers and even young adults, um, that you know, it may not necessarily have anything to do with something you ate. It might have something to do with your hormones or any of these other 30 things that cause your blood sugar to go high. Okay. So, um, so illness can cause high blood sugar in a couple of different ways. So um, first of all, uh, your blood sugar can release um, or excuse me, your body can release, uh, your liver can release glucose into your body to help give you energy to deal with the illness. So that'll raise your blood sugar. Typically when you're sick, your body also releases cortisol to help reduce the inflammation that you have at the cellular level. Um, it, being sick and having that extra cortisol in your body can also cause you to be more insulin resistant. And sometimes medications that you take for your illness can cause your blood sugar to go high. Here's a secret trick. And this secret trick is going into my sick day arsenal presentation that I'll be doing sometime within the next couple of months. But um, a secret trick is anytime you're sick, um, well, first of all, you know when you're sick because you can feel it. You may not feel pain though. You might have the sniffles, you might have a stomach ache or whatever, but guess what? Whenever you're sick, your cells are inflamed and experiencing inflammation that is causing your body to release cortisol into your um into your it's causing your adrenal gland to release cortisol into your body causing your blood sugar to go up well guess what there is another way that you can reduce that inflammation at the cellular level and prevent your body from releasing so much cortisol and that's by taking an nsaid or non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drug. I'm talking about Motrin, ibuprofen, Aleve. So anytime you get sick, even if you don't have a headache, even if you don't feel like you need a Motrin, go ahead and take Motrin round the clock. Um, Motrin's every six hours, Aleve is every 12 hours. So I like to take Aleve just because it's more convenient, but that will actually prevent your blood sugar from going higher because you'll be reducing the inflammation in your cells via that medication and your body will not need to use so much cortisol. Um, if you have questions on that, uh, let me know or just go ahead and type it into the chat. Okay. So you've probably been told to either wipe your finger with an alcohol swab or wash your hands before you prick your finger to check your blood sugar. Uh, and of course, that's because it can cause an inaccurate blood glucose reading. Uh, we were actually, at, this was at an, a diabetes camp in New Jersey. A couple of us were treating a little girl whose blood sugar was low in the middle of the night. We gave her those powdery glucose tablets to eat. 
And then when we needed to recheck her 20 minutes later, we just poked her finger and her blood sugar was 500. And we were like, wow, those were really effective glucose tablets. But <laughs> what happened was <laughs> that powder from the glucose was on her hand and it caused that inaccurate blood glucose reading. Fortunately, we figured it out pretty quickly um, and had her wash her hands to recheck again. For those of you who are using uh, a continuous glucose monitor, uh, this isn't necessarily a problem with you know having stuff on your fingers however you can have an inaccurate blood glucose reading with your cgm in some cases because um, you're not necessarily calibrating it at the right time or you're experiencing what's called a compression low um, on your cgm or something like that so just keep that in mind if you ever if you ever don't feel like the meter says your blood sugar is uh, check again <laughs> so Fear goes with adrenaline. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this um, other than to say, does anyone know what movie this was from? If you do, go ahead and type it into the comments, but if not, uh, that's okay too. I'm gonna go ahead and move on from fear and talk about sugar-free. Oh my gosh. So this is, aha, we have a winner. Someone knew what, that, what movie that was from. Good work. Uh, so sugar-free and no sugar added is um, just a label that uh, companies can put on boxes. Now, they do mean something. So like they're, they're complying with some FDA rules when they're using the term sugar-free versus no sugar added. And um, what that means to a lot of people is that, oh, I should buy this because it doesn't have any carbs in it. And I'm on the you know low carb, high fat diet or the keto diet or the Atkins diet or the whatever diet. And I'm going to eat this because I totally can because it's sugar free or it's no sugar added. And uh, my advice is to not even look at those um, labels on the front because they don't actually mean anything from a blood sugar perspective. What we really need to look at um, are the labels on the back, the nutrition labels. So uh, this nutrition label that we're looking at here is the nutrition label for uh, sugar-free, um, blue bunny, everything free ice cream or something like that. And so as you can see, this is still going to raise your blood sugar because look at the total carbs. And yes, I know you can subtract the fiber and in some, uh, in some worlds, um, people claim that you can subtract the sugar alcohols, which you should never do from the total carbohydrates. But um, essentially, sugar-free and no sugar added will still raise your blood sugar. And I mean, look, if you're gonna have ice cream, like if you're gonna have ice cream, look at the back of the um, carton on the sugar-free versus the regular ice cream, and you'll discover that from a blood sugar perspective, it makes no difference. From a taste perspective, you should really choose the sugar-filled ice cream because it's not gonna be any worse for you than the sugar-free ice cream. That's in another webinar too, but we can talk about that more later. Uh, sleep apnea. So a lot of folks think that sleep apnea only happens to people who are older and heavier, and that's just not true. Um, in fact, it is very probable, according to my respiratory therapy team, that I had sleep apnea since I was about 11 years old. And that is because basically of the position of um, my tongue and my mouth, and I don't really know all of the words to describe all of this stuff that's in our mouths, but basically uh, I block my own airway every night and I've been doing that since I was like 11. And guess what happens when your body stops breathing in the middle of the night? Your adrenaline kicks in. And guess what happens when your adrenaline kicks in? Oh my gosh, there goes my blood sugar. And so if you are dealing with some really, really bad dawn phenomenon, ask for a sleep study just to rule out sleep apnea. You may not be older, you may not be heavy, um, but it doesn't matter. You could still have sleep apnea and that could still be affecting your blood sugar. And when you have sleep apnea and it raises your blood sugar, that means you need more insulin. That means your body is taking that sugar and storing it in your cells. And some of it's being used as energy and some of it's being stored as fat. So yes, sleep apnea can cause you to actually gain weight. So uh, if that's not an incentive to go get a sleep apnea study, I don't know what is. 
All right, friends, we've got just a few more slides and then um, we can be done and I can, I can open it up to um, chatting or whatever. So um, we'll talk about some cold medicines. This is pretty easy. So there are two different ways that cold medicines can uh, raise your blood sugar. Um, one reason is that just some cold medicines have sugar in them. So it's important to check. You can ask the pharmacist if it's not listed on the bottle to see if there's extra sugar in cold medicines. And remember, if you have a cold, your blood sugar is gonna be higher anyway because of all the extra cortisol. So you don't need to be adding extra sugar into your body by way of cold medicine. Uh, there's also another way cold medicines can raise your blood sugar, um, a particular decongestant called pseudoephedrine. That's like the um, old school Sudafed that they no longer sell on the shelves anymore because um, people use it to make meth, um, but you can still buy it from behind the counter. And it's, it's really good stuff. Like it actually works. Like if you have a stuffed up nose, the thing you want to take is pseudoephedrine because that is the thing that is going to cause your nose to become unstuffed. But unfortunately, that is also the thing that causes your body to release epinephrine, raising your blood sugar. So if you are going to have pseudoephedrine uh, medications for your colds uh, or for your sniffles, uh, keep an eye on that blood sugar because it could go up. So isn't it nice to know all this stuff? Because now when people are like, what'd you do to make your blood sugar so high? You could be like, well, let me get the list of things and I'll you know, work through it with you and we can decide together. Um, I get that from my doctor too. What did you do this day to make your blood sugar 300? Anyway, um, so heat alone doesn't increase your blood sugar, but your activity in the heat can increase your blood sugar, um, as can the heat's effects on um, the medications that you're taking. So first, extreme heat can spoil insulin. So if you are using an insulin pump or if you have your insulin with you and you're out in the sun, um, that can actually destroy your insulin. So that could cause high blood sugar if you take insulin and it's bad insulin. Um, secondly, the exercise that you perform in the heat uh, can cause you to overexert yourself which can cause your liver to release extra, um, extra glucose into your body to kind of save you or help you or give you more energy. And so that can cause uh, a rise in blood sugar as well. So, all right, Let's talk about travel. Uh, travel just kicks my butt, you guys. I, I used to have a travel job. I had a travel job for 10 years. I was just flying all over the place and uh, pretty much, had really, uh, really undesirable blood sugars the entire time. Um, think about it, right? Like, let's say that um, every day at three o'clock in the morning, my body pushes extra sugar into my blood because it's trying to help me wake up. There's that dawn phenomenon that happens every day at three o'clock in the morning. Well, let's say I fly across the world to like Italy or something. My three o'clock in the morning is now like two o'clock in the afternoon or whatever. I'm probably wrong on the math here, but uh, <laughs> on the time zones here, but, uh, but at two o'clock in the afternoon in a new country, I could experience dawn phenomenon, totally screwing everything up. And so travel can just make everything um, really difficult. And so um, my advice uh, for those of you who take insulin is if you're going to travel for just a couple of days, um, don't don't take your insulin at a different time. Take your insulin on your home time. So just pretend like you're at home and take your insulin then. Uh, so for example, if you take your long acting insulin at 9 p.m. in Arizona, well, um, if you go to um, Michigan or something like that, then you need to take your insulin at 11 o'clock in Michigan because that's when 9 p.m. in Arizona is or whatever. Um, if you go for more than a week, then you're gonna to need to make adjustments. So you do need to eventually start to adjust to being on the new time zone. So short trips don't really change anything. Just pretend like your body's on its home time zone. For long trips, you're gonna to have to adjust. I really thought these guys deserved their own slide. I know they are just carbs and they belonged on the first slide with all of the other carbs, but seriously, I don't know what happens to me when I eat a bagel or a potato, but there's like no amount of insulin I can take 
to cause my blood sugar to not be 300 after I've eaten a bagel or a potato. If anyone knows a trick, besides pre-bolusing, which sometimes works, uh, to dealing with bagels and potatoes, please feel free to let me know. Otherwise, I'm keeping this slide up here. All right. Let's talk about this scary looking word. Uh, so, have you ever like woken up in the morning and had a good blood sugar? Sorry, my cat is trying to enter the webinar right now. Um, have you ever woken up in the, in the morning to a pretty decent blood sugar of say like 90? And then you're like, yeah, I'm not gonna have any carbs this morning because I, I don't wanna ruin a perfect blood sugar. So I'm gonna just eat some eggs because that's like protein and maybe a little fat. So like you eat your little pile of eggs and then by like 11 o'clock, uh, your blood sugar's 250. Does that ever happen to you? Go ahead and say yes in the chat if it has, or you can say, Kara, seriously, I have no idea what you're talking about. That would be fine too. Um, that's happened to me. And it happens to a lot of people. And that is because in the absence of actual carbohydrates in your blood, um, your body can, or excuse me, in the absence of actual glucose in your blood, your body can create glucose from non-carbohydrates um, that are in your body. So essentially, um, when you eat protein, protein breaks down into amino acids. And if you don't have carbs in your body and your body needs carbs, your body can reconfigure those amino acids and turn them into carbohydrates. Um, so, oh, someone said this happens to my daughter and the school nurse actually blamed her and called her a liar. You know what? We should have, we should have a webinar all about school nurses. That is what we should have because I can't tell you how many stories I hear about school nurses and school whatevers. And uh, you know what? I'm going to defer to the ADA on that because they use nicer language when they talk about school nurses. Um, but I'm so sorry that happened to you um, and that the school nurse blamed your, blamed your child. Um, diabetics get blamed for a lot. I mean, every blood sugar that you test and exists is um, somehow immediately your fault. Um, I think the point of this webinar is that like, it's not always your fault. Like you do not have complete and total control over all 30 things that can affect your blood sugar, especially if you have multiple of those things going on at the same time. So, I mean, it's anybody's guess what you did to cause your blood sugar to be so high, right? Um, it's, it's not very fair. So, um, yes, your body can create sugar out of amino acids through a process called gluconeogenesis. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's frustrating because sometimes you have to take insulin uh, when you eat protein. So there you have it. All right. So I think that I am. All right. You know what? We are just going to add the cat to the webinar. Uh, oh my gosh, everybody. This is shenanigans. He has really long claws. Uh, but we've got like two slides left and then we'll be able to talk or chat whatever you guys are more comfortable with. Um, I do want to share with you that um, I'm going to, I continue to do these free webinars like every I don't know, um, every, every like two months or so. And so I try to think of fun and interesting topics to share with everybody. And so um, in a minute, I'd like to ask you guys what your favorite topic might be for the next webinar, which is actually gonna be July 28th. Um, but I also wanted to share with you that I'm gonna be facilitating an eight week blood glucose reset. This is gonna be a pretty intense event. It is going to be a live event where essentially um, we're gonna meet via Zoom, just like this, this webinar system that we're using right now, uh, once a week to learn a new thing about uh, managing your blood sugar. And then each week you learn something new, you apply that thing that you've learned and you create a record of all of the experiments um, that you've run on your blood sugar and all of the stuff that you've done to um, essentially first flatline your baseline blood sugar, second create your own insulin sensitivity factor, which of course doctors assign to you, but is probably wrong. Um, and also figure out what your carb limits are. So um, if any, this is not a free event. Um, this is a paid event. Um, and you're certainly welcome to, you know, think about it or whatever. Um, but if you want to look at it or find out some more about it, 
you can go to um, online.bootcampforbedics.org. And there's also a bunch of other courses there as well. Um, and because you attended this webinar today, we do have um, a coupon code. It's just the word HIGH, H-I-G-H. H -I -G -H. So even if you want to just do like say, you know, one of the little courses like the five day blood sugar assessment or something like that, um, you can enroll in the course and enter the code HIGH -H, and you would get it for like $12 instead of 24. So the HIGH -H code is going to be good for about three hours today, uh, two hours from now actually. And so um, if you want to enroll in either uh, the live eight week glucose reset, which will include all of these other courses um, upon completion or any other of the self-paced courses, you're certainly welcome to do so uh, using that 50% off code. And then lastly, um, I would like to know from you guys, uh, which of these two topics you think looks more interesting for the July 28th webinar? Do you think we should do building your diabetic sick day arsenal? Uh, or do you think we should do a full webinar on how to drink safely while diabetic? So um, go ahead and type in your response in the chat. And then um, if you want to go ahead and, well, whoops, if you want to go ahead and pre-register for this webinar that doesn't have a name yet, I'm going to just hopefully put the link in there. Uh, looks Looks like a lot. We will eventually get to both of these topics, I think. Um, it looks like we're probably going to do sick day arsenal. Cool. I don't have that one written yet, so <laughs> I've got some work to do. Thanks, you guys. Um, if you want to go ahead and pre-register for that, you're welcome to do so. I just put the, um, I just put the link in there. If you do want to ask a question out loud, um, you can unmute yourself using the buttons in the Zoom console. There's like a mute button that should be like kind of highlighted right now and you can you should be able to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question or if you just have a general question or a comment you can put that in the chat and I am gonna try and pull my um, video off but I'll keep the audio on so that we can still see the computer screen we can still chat um, I'm just um, I'm just uh, worried that that cat's gonna come back and get all in front of you guys so um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Realize um, going to a webinar on a Saturday morning kind of sucks, and that's my fault for picking a bad time. Uh, the next one's going to be on a Sunday evening. I don't know if that's actually going to be better or worse, but uh, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to uh, go ahead and ask them either aloud or in the chat. And um, otherwise, if you've got a goal, uh, thank you very much for coming, everybody, and I hope to see you next time.